Um, anyway, two lectures. Hey. Um, I'm sorry because I might lose my voice because I'm, I've got a nasty cold. So if you cannot hear me or didn't understand something I said, just put your hands up, okay? Um, and uh, so we are going to see two different points that they are quite important for genetic analysis in plants and actually for plant breeding and actually where, where we are going uh, in the future with it. And one of them is to do with quantitative population genetics and another one is about how we apply the biotechnology and how, where are we going to actually get the food security. So, as I said, so we do five minutes break in between and then we can finish. So, um, basically, I'm going to do more or less what we did last session where actually I'm giving you a very short historical perspective, but actually to bring you out of what all these ideas came and, and how they came into uh, genetics, really. And they, they were quite important ones. Um, see how um, all this actually came from two different perspectives. One was Mendel, what he found out on the uh, inheritance units, and the other one was the concept of evolution and how things have been changing and what Darwin growth. And people uh, early on in genetics, they are starting to, to bring these things together and, and seeing the correlation in between them. And actually trying to explain these two different things, it was hard for them, as we will see. Um, then I will just go quickly, but um, in a basic way to remind you what population genetics and quantitative genetics are, and actually bringing the importance of them for plant breeding that we will see later on uh, in actually uh, QTLs. Don't worry, we, we won't be doing mapping QTLs or anything like that. It will be more applications on that. So, um, as I said, it was, genetics was born as a science in the early 1900s, uh, 1900, sorry. <coughs> um, and basically, as I said, all the scientists were trying to bring together what Mendel said, what Darwin said, and actually they realized it has to be related. There has to be a, a correlation in between these things. And, and that's who actually bring the genetics forward. And quite early on, there were two main, main schools of thinking. Uh, one, that he was using mathematics, and uh, it was the biometricians, and uh, basically the key ones were Carl Persson and Walter Weldon, and they were actually discussing that everything is uh, just done with uh, statistical analysis, all that evolution, all this different uh, genetic, genetic uh, appearance of phenotypes are coming from uh, how many you have, or basically numbers. Whereas the Mendelians, they were basically vindicated by the ones who, as you remember, uh, name genes and uh, genetics, Bateson and Johansen, actually were more, no, you, we have a clear case here where, yeah, using numbers is telling us that there is something that is segregating and is actually producing this uh, genetic of inheritance. And actually, now we know that both of them are right, but at that time, they were really, really competitive in between them. And they were writing really nasty letters one to each other. So thanks God there was no uh, Twitter at that time. Um, but yeah, there, there were quite personal uh, communications in between them, that they, they, it was quite nasty. And then, basically, it took a few years. So in the 1930s is when statistics started to work for both of them and actually bring the proper genetic uh, science forward to actually analyze the, the data that they have. And uh, basically they realized that there was, they were called themselves Neo-Darwinians and there was basically a more than evolutionary synthesis with different phenotypes coming from one specific unit, the gene, and others that they were being more, as we will see, quantitative. Uh, and obviously, population genetics was born in between them. Um, a key figure was Ronald Fisher, that actually developed several basic statistical methods. 
um, and grow about that from the genetic uh, perspective, uh, right to develop the modern population genetics and actually bring down uh, what Mendel say together, what actually the numbers were showing to these people. How then was very important actually to see how the frequency of alleles were actually brought in different conditions. And I always put this here just to remind you, because you have seen this before, didn't you? Have you seen the pepper moths? So when anyone can tell me something, anything that you remember about it, okay? This is not a test. It's, I don't have voice. Yeah? So it then become darker. So, yeah, birch trees, the, this one, the typical one, was the clear one to actually be in camouflage on them, so they would not be eaten so much. But then when industrialization appeared, the trees were very contaminated, and they started to be darker, quite dark. And uh, actually, this allele for... Uh, the pepper moth survived longer. So it was a clear way of saying how evolution and uh, selection actually works, okay? If it survives, actually uh, go forward. And so this actually started to bring um, different ideas uh, of uh, populations. And in genetics, basically, all depends on the frequency of a specific allele in a specific gene, okay? And how it's distributed through the population. Um, obviously, they are influenced by different things that we will see in the next slide, so don't worry. So natural selection, genetic drift, mutation, and gene flow. So we, I will explain more about that in the next slide. Um, but also the factors like Remember, myotic recombination, how different hybrids could actually be doing, uh, different subdivisions in the population, of how is the structure of the population. And basically, this new uh, field in genetics, so, uh, called population genetics, what they try actually to explain is how the species were adapted and how they actually were born, okay? How was the species here? speciation. So um, they use a statistical genetics in order to link the variation in the phenotype. And this, as we will see later on, is, has been used quite a lot in pram breeding too. Okay. So anyone can tell me anything about this? Do you remember the hardy Weinberg principle? So basically, when you have one allele, uh, let's say a recessive uh, allele uh, in homozygosis, AA, and heterozygosis, or in homozygosis for the big AA, the other allele, basically when one allele in homozygosis goes down, the other goes up, and you have the heterozygotes that they will be high in the middle. But that's something that is logic, if you think about that, yeah? So basically, as you said, when you know the frequency uh, of one, you will know the frequency of the other, just by assuming how it works. So as I said, there are different things that uh, population genetics use, and I just define it very quickly here, just, just to bring you uh, to your attention. So natural selection, as in the case of the pepper moth, is very important. So traits are more likely to survive and reproduce than others, okay? So if they don't reproduce, if they don't survive, end of the game, okay? Game over. Uh, genetic drift, uh, basically, is the layer of frequencies that could be caused by random sampling. Once you are studying these kind of things, you just randomly sample in a field, and actually some of these changes might be just because you took uh, different uh, samples in different ways. Um, Mutation is quite important. There could be actually new mutations that they appear in the population and actually the alleles could be different. 
um, and actually bringing new alleles into the whole study. Gene flow, so they might be exchanged with other populations that they are around and actually bring something else uh, about that. Um, so the key thing that actually population genetics also brought is that the phenotypic value is not only the genetic value, but there is also some environmental pressure coming under that, okay? That actually is measured by all these different things that actually affect that, okay? Yeah? So, this also brought into the attention that actually there were some characters that they didn't behave as uh, the colors, green and yellow, from the piece from Mendel. Um, it was not just clear that only one character in the genetic, in the genes, actually will produce this phenotype, okay? Uh, and this is actually what it brought all that dispute in between the two um, big um, classes of thinking during the beginning of genetics. But actually, quantitative genetics is bringing all together again, because what it says is that there will be some traits, um, there are phenotypic characteristics, that actually uh, underlie mechanisms that they could be attributable they could actually come from two or more uh, genes, okay? Or interactions of these genes. And this makes things more complicated because obviously uh, these genes and their interactions with the environment actually could give different phenotypes and actually something that is more tricky to measure, okay? And um, clear examples is the height and the weight, not only in humans but in plants. That, uh, that is a clear... Uh, complex trait. So these phenotypic traits, uh, they have a variation along a continuous distribution of values. So the bell curve that you see here is how you have the different values that you could measure. Uh, same in here. So you will have most of the population will be something in between, that mean of the population, but you will have individuals in the population with high numbers or small numbers, okay? So, just in height, this is a good example in any textbook in genetics, and I always bring it so you understand it a little better. So, human high is a compressed trait, and uh, if I will do the experiment, uh, we could go out and put you in different heights. I'm not going to do that, so don't worry. Uh, you will see that the mean or average height will be somewhere in the middle, and you will have individuals that will be taller, individuals that will be shorter, okay? Um, I brought this because it's quite interesting also for um, more complex traits later on with plants. So I, I, we could do a very nice example. So here we separated the humans by sex, and they basically realized that men, the mean is higher than women, okay? That doesn't mean that there are men that they have shorter stature than women, okay? It's just that the mean of the population that it was measured is different. Everyone is okay with that? Yeah? So, <coughs> plants are not different, okay? And quite a lot of the interesting things or traits that we want to have, uh, like size of the fruits, high of the plant, uh, as we will see, flowering time and seeds, uh, the yield of the seeds is very important uh, and, and they are coming from not just one gene but a combination of genes, okay? And obviously this makes things more complicated because you cannot just find for allele that is good for you. You have to find the combination of alleles that they are good for the plant. So, Coming back to the bell um, example that we saw with the human high, this is basically to summarize what we've been doing since the beginning of civilization, okay? The Cro-Magnon man was walking around the fields and they found really big juicy tomatoes and they decided to collect the seeds and grow them for the next generation. 
because they were big. In the next generation, they have a population of plants that they were a little smaller of the ones that they collect, a little higher, and very high. But obviously, the mean on that population that they are coming from a few fruits, it was bigger. It was bigger tomatoes, probably nicer tomatoes, okay? And generation after generation, collecting the ones that they wanted to improve and the characters that they wanted to have, that's what they have been improving, okay? So it makes sense. You, you select the ones that they are better, you grow them, and you basically, if they are coming from complex traits, you will be improving it, yeah? So this is basically something that has been done in agriculture since the beginning, okay? And basically, clear examples, uh, maize is a very good example too. So from very small corns uh, up to very big, so variation is quite high, and actually people have been uh, selecting for different things, more grain, less grain, sweetness, different things that they could be interested in. This is actually just to show you that these uh, bells, depending on the variety, they might have some populations might be very, or, or some of the characters that they're analyzing might have different shapes. So, for example, the blue one, um, most of the population is on the mean, okay? And very, very low numbers are in the different uh, or, or high um, differences from the mean. This one, the red one, is a little opposite. You can see that they, the mean is a little lower and there are more individuals that they are actually in the size. The yellow is even bigger difference. So the difference in between the mean and the others, uh, the numbers that they are of the, the individuals with these characters are not so big difference like in the blue. So you can actually realize how the trade is going and how it's related. So most of the plant breeding uh, books or uh, genetic analysis in plants, they always tell that plant breeding always trying to increase the quality of the crop and the yield. Okay? What else do you think these days is bringing? <coughs> Yeah, so anything to do with disease resistance, uh, pathogens that they could actually alter the production. Easy harvesting. Easy harvesting, we were going to see a very good example uh, in a bit. What else? Temperature changes, so uh, any environmental changes that actually could affect. So actually the things have been increased quite a lot, okay? So increasing tolerance to different environmental pressures, uh, temperature, drought, salinity, even flooding, okay? So different parts of the globe will require different conditions to grow, okay? So we want to have crops that actually will grow in any of them, okay? So there will be differences in between them. Um, as you say, resistance to uh, any disease be, uh, produced by viruses, fungi, bacteria, even insect pests, that they could actually destroy um, the pool um, production of the plant. But there is another one that um, if you check online, you will find uh, GM crops that they have resistance to herbicides. So why? you want to have? In the case of the Roundup Ready plants, mm -hmm. they obviously make them crop resistant, then they spray the whole field with rice and again, which kills off all the um, competing weeds. So, so I always put this in a way that is, um, yeah, you're right, sorry, um, in a way that is, you don't have to think too much. So if you want to grow a field let's say wheat, okay? What are the things that are important for the farmer? That you don't have all the supplements you put in the soil, everything that you are watering, the only thing that you have in the field is the wheat, okay? It's your crop. You want that crop to produce 
quite a good deal. So you can make some profit or actually get enough food for your animals or whatever you need to do with that. But you need to give minimum of yield, so that's quite important. If the quality is good, you might be able to sell it for more money, so you could get more profit. But one of the things, as you said too, um, basically that is easy to collect, and the easiest way to collect is when you have a field that is growing homogeneously. All the plants are growing at the same time and producing the seeds at the same time. Once you have that, you pass the machine and you collect it very quickly. Okay? And this is something that you require to make more profit too. Okay? So all these things make what we are talking about plant breeding a little more difficult to understand sometimes. And we will see some examples later that they don't make any sense too. But uh, because we are stupid consumers, we buy anything that we think is cool. So you will see too how plant breeding in that way is, is a little different. So quantitative trade locus, or QTLs, are regions of the DNA that actually are associated to a particular phenotypic uh, trait. Could be the size of the plant, the size of the fruit, um, sweetness, whatever. And it's not just one gene, it's two or more genes, and normally are found uh, in different regions of the genome or in different chromosomes, okay? Uh, they could be in the same region of the chromosome, some of them, but others will be in different chromosomes. Um, so to actually be able to know which traits or which part of the genome actually are involved in this phenotype, uh, researchers are doing what we call the QTL mapping. And it's basically a statistical, a statistical study of the gene interactions uh, that determine this complex trait. Okay? Um, QTL uh, normally define specific gene regions of the genome. Uh, genomics these days is actually bringing out these regions and actually scientists realize which genes are in these regions and actually are able to know which genes are affecting all these things. So mm -hmm. that brings quite a lot of different things. So for QTL techniques, basically, we need two major things. One is actually have the right strains. What did Mendel started with. Anyone remember? With peas, yeah? So what, what kind of peas he chose to cross? So he had two varieties that they were different color or different size. And actually, when they grow together, they were always given the same phenotype. And basically what he did is cross them. Okay, so this is what we call uh, inbred strains or inbred lines. They are lines that they are most likely in homozygosis for that specific phenotype that you want to study. Yeah? So remember what we talked in the first lecture. Variation in genetics is a key importance, okay? You need variation to be able to bring these things. Once you have variation, you can do the crosses and actually study what is happening with the segregation. And in QTLs, it's the same. You need these inbred strain lanes, as we will see, or cultivars, and actually cross them and then analyze the offspring, okay? The other thing that they is required is genetic markers. So from RFLPs, or restriction fragment length polymorphisms, <coughs> microsats, single nucleotide polymorphisms, or these days, as I say, just sequencing. Okay, you can sequence the whole bit that actually is related with the QTL. So, in a way, you can study all these different regions uh, that they could be uh, affecting a specific complex trait. So this is just an example of one of these markers that basically you know RFLPs, so just run DNA samples digested with uh, restriction uh, enzymes, then blot them in a filter and actually use probes to actually uh, check different regions of the genome. And this is a nice example of what they have done in Bali, just to study the different varieties and how the segregation of the bands and different regions with and without, uh, you can actually have a very good um, 
idea of what kind of phenotype the plant has, and each plant with a different phenotype, which kind of marker you have on genetics. So you can actually start to extrapolate that plants with a specific marker here, actually they grow faster or, or, or slower. So key important things for QTLs, as I said, is these inbred lines, okay? And the main reason is because we are going to actually produce the reels of recombinant inbred lines. And these are the lines that basically what you do is just cross an inbred line A with a B uh, that they might have different flower time uh, and you just want to see odd stress tolerance. So one is, sorry, let's, let's say stress tolerant because it's written here. So one is uh, tolerant, another one is sensitive, so it, it just dies with the stress and you can actually mark it with different uh, SMPs uh, to actually see which regions of the genome actually are affected. So what you do is cross the inbred lines. In the first generation, you have a hybrid that is basically half of the chromosomes from dad and half of the chromosomes from mom, yeah? And remember what happened in meiosis for this specific individual is going to have recombination, okay? So chromosome one from that and chromosome one from mom is going to go through meiosis. They are going to recombine in different regions and they are going to exchange part of these chromosomes, okay? And if you go through different generations, you will manage to get something like this where you've got chromosomes that they are mostly uh, mums, but with some bits of dads, okay? And this is what we call uh, the reco uh, recombinant inbred lines that they are coming from that. Uh, a near isogenic line is basically the target that we want to have. So it's a new line that differs from its parent only in one specific genome location that actually it might be the one that contains QTL characters, okay? whatever trait that we are following. When we do this, always we bring together a phenotypic analysis. So we analyze how the plants look, if they are, in this case, stress tolerant or stress sensitive. Stress could be temperature, could be drought, anything that you think about that it could affect the growth. And then you check the markers. You see which markers are and which ones are not to actually know which region of the genome is affected and produce this kind of mapping on the whole chromosomes to actually know which ones are. As I said these days, you can go and sequence all that region and actually have quite a lot of information on which genes will be candidates to actually be affecting your uh, character. This is an example I always put because it started with a good idea and uh, just at the beginning it was not so good. So this is a typical example of what they do um, with um, this QTL. So it's, um, they cross as a, a peel the sample line of melon that is a very um, well-known uh, Spanish variety with very sweet um, taste on, on the melon. And they wanted to cross it with a Korean uh, variety, that is this one, that is not that sweet, but the skin is really hard, okay? So the main reason is what they wanted to have is a melon that is sweet and nice, but with a hard skin, so it's easy to transport, okay? So it's not going to be rotten on the supermarkets. So as I said, sometimes you have to double think um, why some of the plant breeders are doing what they are doing because the main reason here is just how uh, much profit they could have if the melons don't rot in the way or they don't break in the way, uh, in the way to the supermarket. So they did a cross between these two guys and this came along. This is the first hybrid. So I just say they have a skin that it was the peel sapo skin, so it brought quite well, and uh, it was horrible to eat. So the hybrid was no any use, okay? But then they crossed back again 
to the melon that they sweet one and trying to see if they could get uh, the generation after generation all these traits that they wanted, okay? And actually they have something in between, so they managed to get some of these QTLs, some lines that actually uh, behave more, more or less with the sweetness of the melon and the skin was a little harder than the normal PL de sapo. So in a way, they managed to get it. And this is the whole idea of plant breeders, what they are doing constantly, okay? Any questions about that? Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. So they bred it uh, again with the parents? Yeah, so, so quite often, I mean, there are some uh, crops, some plant species that they can cross with itself, okay? So if you can cross with itself, you just keep crossing and crossing with itself. And, and it, it will go to different generations that you will have something very specific. But Normally, what we call, uh, you have, um, or the reference parent will be the crop that you want to have, something like the sweetness of the melon, or what also is known, as we will see in a second, the elite crop, okay? It's the one that you grow on the fields, yeah? The other one, the donor palate, is the one that brings the trait that you want to put into that uh, reference uh, crop, yeah? So in this case, it's the hard skin, okay? That by itself is, is just a character that you want to include in that. So the main reason to actually, in the first hybrid, you cross it to the elite crop or the reference crop is actually because you want to have that plus the bit of the other. You don't want the opposite, okay? Yeah? So, <clears throat> so these are, again, more examples of different uh, QTLs. So this is papaya, uh, and uh, basically are different QTLs for growth and flowering. So plant height, uh, stem diameter, and flowering. So why uh, a farmer would be interested in the flowering time? What would be important? Faster harvests, yeah? But what else? If you um, synchronize, then obviously you crops So you want to homogenize the flower in time, specific times. What else? If we bring into it environmental cues. Synchronize it with pollinators. Pollinators, but also synchronize it with the weather, okay? You don't want to have crops that they are actually flowering at the end of winter, and then there's a frost, and it kills everything, okay? And climate change is bringing this into uh, the whole um, picture, really, because in a way, they are starting to appear uh, flowering times that they are starting in March, April, and uh, especially trees in some parts of Europe have been shown that actually get frozen, so they didn't produce seeds in the last two, three years. And the main reason is because the flowering time is the same of the year, but uh, suddenly the climate change has brought differences on that uh, terms. And actually that, that could be something that it would be very, very important in future years to actually bring up into pram breeding. And pram breeders are not stupid, so it's something that they've been studying quite a lot. So this is just uh, Arabidopsis thaliana, that is the mother plant, as I showed you, the w small wheat in, um, that we use in plant research. And these are different QTLs related to flowering time. So as you can see, it's something highly, highly complex. Um, and it, it is really, really difficult to, to actually follow. The other bit I want you to bring into the table is that uh, concept of having the elite uh, variety or, or crop that we are growing and actually bringing all these QTLs from different varieties into, um, into that. So 
if flowering time is so difficult because there are so many genes involved, imagine when you are trying to do all the traits like the number of grains or the grain size, the soil stress tolerance of the salt tolerance. So you, you can start thinking about how complex all these things are, how difficult actually uh, in some regions uh, is going to be to bring that traits into the crop that we are have in the field, that we are happy with it at the moment, but that we want to improve. So uh, it makes it a little more difficult and, and harder to, to get. Uh, this is just to finish, and we can make a break uh, before we start with the other next lecture. Um, so this is uh, two genes that they've been isolated by QTLs in rice about flowering time. And basically, you can see in the mutant, it requires, uh, sorry, uh, to produce the flowers and actually collect the seeds um, longer time than in the normal cases, and they found two genes in the variety, the two varieties that they I studied to do the QTL analysis, and uh, in the genes, actually, they found uh, differences in between, and they found that these are the ones that they are producing these traits. And the main reason is that you can have uh, different experiments where you include into the mutant the or not a mutant, but the variety that is uh, taking longer to actually produce the flowers, you can put the gene of the other variety that actually is on the right time, and you can do that complementation test that I, we were talking about in last week, and actually fill out that you are complementing, you are uh, actually uh, reducing the, the times for flowering. So, in a way, the genetic analysis with QTLs is kind of similar. Once you find the gene, you do the genetic analysis that we were talking last week. You have your mutant, you complement it, you analyze, it's doing what I think it's doing. And that's how you find out what that QTL is actually, or that gene is doing. So, uh, five minutes break, yeah? And uh, I talk more about it.